So I think, uh, I think we'll start. Um, so again, um, as I said, I'm, I'm super proud to, to have uh, Dr. Steven Salzberg here uh, from, from Johns Hopkins. Um, and Steven, we've, we've worked with Steven and, and his um, colleagues on a couple of really exciting projects. And um, before we get to his presentation, which is you know obviously the reason you guys are here, I do wanna just give a quick overview. So we're all on the same page regarding what Dovetail is, what we do, and uh, De Novo Assembly. There could be some folks on the call that are either new to De Novo Assembly or new to what Dovetail does. So I just wanna, this should be only around ten, five, uh, eight or 10 minutes. So um, basically Dovetail, uh, you know, our, our specialization is proximity ligation. So most of our core um, services uh, and products center around that um, technology. And, and you know, the, the definition of proximity ligation is essentially that um, two points in three-dimensional. So what we do is we chop up the chromosomes yeah, with an endonuclease or a restriction enzyme. And then we, we allow the, um, the ends to, to ligate back together. So we add a ligase and the chromosomes are fixed, fixed in space. So we chop up the chromosomes, we ligate back together, and um, two points that are closer together in three-dimensional space, like the ones I've circled here, are more likely to ligate than two points that are farther away in three-dimensional space. So this is not a linear distance, this is three-dimensional distance because we're working with intact chromosomes in situ. And Essentially, when you, um, when you create a library of all of these proximity ligation events and sequence them, you get um, this kind of a curve, which is essentially um, very steep here where there are a lot of connections because um, it's more likely that close uh, parts of the chromosome uh, ligate. And then it slowly slopes off to here where you get you know, far fewer um, events but you get this very nice even distribution of proximity ligation events. And those events can then be used to um, gauge distance. And essentially it allows us to scaffold um, chromosomes up to um, chromosome scale. Uh, this is the kind of timeline um, for Dovetail. So we started in 2013. Um, we came out of a lab uh, in UC Santa Cruz at Green's lab, and he was working with the American alligator and he developed this protocol called Chicago, which you'll, you might hear about. Um, Chicago is essentially proximity ligation, but done in vitro versus in situ. Um, and Nick Putnam wrote the software for scaffolding that we use called HiRISE, and we still use that software today. Uh, 2015, um, we came out with Dovetail High C, which is an in situ version of Chicago. So this is the chromosome scale scaffolding technology that we developed. Um, again, it's similar to traditional restriction enzyme-based HIC with some with some tweaks. Um, and the first genome we did um, with um, our HIC was the lettuce uh, for UC Davis. And then last year we uh, released OmniC, which is um, a restriction-free version of HIC. So instead of using restriction enzyme, we use an endonuclease, which gives more even coverage across the genome. And I'll touch on that in a few minutes. And uh, we're still using HiRISE for the uh, software. And um, Narwhale was one of the first uh, genomes we did um, using OmniC. Then um, this year, we're now, um, again, phasing assemblies. Um, uh, this is not yet available, but it will be very, very soon. And looking to the later this year and beyond, um, uh, hopefully we can um, uh, launch the true diploid assembly, which is something that if you guys can answer the poll, whether you'd think that would be beneficial for you, that would be awesome. This is a basic pipeline. So uh, tr generally speaking, we're quite agnostic when it comes to the first step, which is what technology to use to build the basic draft assembly. We have used Nanopore and Stephen um, uh, used Nanopore for his projects. Um, we generally use PacBio for most projects. And um, we, we then scaffold with OmniC, um, and we also do the full annotation here as well. And so you can basically get um, a publishable ready assembly um, 
in one step from, from us. Uh, there are several challenges, as you might expect, with de novo assembly, and uh, four of the main ones are listed there on the left. Um, and um, I think, you know, Stephen can definitely talk to the first one, genome size, um, and probably repeat content as well, um, and even polyploidy. Um, so yeah, there, there's four major challenges, but these can all be overcome um, with primarily by experience. So in other words, We've done so many projects now. We've probably done around 2,000 different assemblies. Um, and the ones on the tree of life here, there's around 400 here, and you can get this tree of life on our website. Um, but these are the assemblies where our customers have said it's okay to publicize these statistics. So it's, it's a portion of all the assemblies we've done. But if you look at our tree of life, you, know, you can really start to see um, patterns. It's really kind of fun to look at this. And the experience comes in where if you're, if you're, let's say, interested in doing a mollusk and, um, you know, we've already done similar species probably to yours and we can draw from that experience and apply that knowledge to your, your particular project. Very quickly, just scaffolding, essentially the molecular biology is shown at the top and the dry lab is shown at the bottom. But the wet lab component, again, we cross-link. Um, we fragment the chromosomes with uh, a DNAs1. We ligate back together. And then we release those cross-links and sequence on HiSeq. And essentially, we get this really nice library of virtually all um, interactions between a kilobase and um, up to telomere, telomere to telomere um, length interactions across the genome. And we take that um, proximity ligation data and put it into our software called HiRISE along with your draft assembly that either we built or you provide us. And uh, we do um, two rounds of HiRISE, one a short range and one a long range. And at the end of the HiRISE run, we have um, a scaffolded assembly and you can see the difference. The, the one on the left is pr prior to HiRISE. You can see that Along the diagonal, each of those little squares is a scaffold, and there's literally tens of thousands of them in this particular assembly. And after high rise, um, you can see the, the chromosomes pop right out, and each square here represents <clears throat> a chromosome. Um, and the, the, the neat thing with OmniC, um, so this um, top um, graphic here represents single restriction high C. The middle one represents multi-restriction high C, and the bottom Omni C. And um, you know we've we've had this evolution of of different high C technologies since 2013. And the 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 thing that you'll see is that um, Omni C is it provides very even coverage. So this is this is um, an IGV um, screenshot of part of the genome, um, showing that um, you know Omni C is really providing near shotgun like coverage. Um, in proximity ligation, which is um, a lot different than the profile you get with single restriction high C, which is what we used to use. And it's still, you still get a wonderful results with single restriction high C. Um, the nice advantage of Omni C, there isn't really too much benefit in terms of contiguity improvement. What we really see as the advantage with Omni C is that because of the very even coverage, we're capturing most of the SNPs of the genome. Um, probably greater than 98% of them, which thus allows us to face uh, very accurately and completely. So what OmniC is really providing are these other applications shown on the right. In addition to assembly, which um, uh, I talked about, you know, you're, you're able to phase and also potentially um, do trip, true deployed assembly um, with that data. So that's it, it for me. Um, I just wanted to give a quick overview. And what I really want to do now is shift to Stephen's talk. Um, and um, again, uh, Stephen is um, um, a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Biomedical Engineering, Computer Science and Biostatistics at Johns Hopkins. And um, um, Stephen, um, I'll shift uh, over to you here. I'm going to stop sharing. OK. Um... Thanks so much, Mark. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, you should see my presentation now. Do you, do you see it? Yes, it looks great, Stephen. Okay, good. So 
Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, hope you get a break from thinking about uh, coronavirus, and we'll talk about genome assembly today. So I'm going to tell you uh, for the next uh, 30, 40 minutes about our project, um, which we call the Redwood Genome Project, which is, in fact, the project to sequence and assemble the genomes of two trees, the giant sequoia and the coast redwood. And we started this a couple of years ago. Uh, it's led by a close colleague of mine named David Neal at the University of California, Davis, uh, and other members of his lab and some other collaborators who I'll mention along the way. So, um, so here's the sort of, sort of picture of the project. Um, that's David's team on the left. Um, and the project was funded by a, a relatively small nonprofit called Save the Redwoods League, and one of their uh, scientific managers, Emily Burns, was actually involved quite a bit in um, not just in funding, but also some of the analysis. And then on the right, you see um, our team at Hopkins, um, which includes my colleague Winston Timp, and then various members of both of our labs. So, um, so the uh, we actually have already announced some results. Um, just about a year ago, we, we um, announced the results on the assembly of the sequoia genome. I'm gonna tell you a lot of details about it in the next few minutes. Um, it got quite a bit of publicity, as you can see here. There's a few of the uh, uh, newspaper or other website articles about it. Um, there's a tremendous interest in these trees because they're such iconic trees. Um, the sequoia uh, and redwood both, um, I will, tell you about assembly today, but I'll also throw in a few things about these trees. They're um, two of the, uh, well, really the two largest trees in the world, two of the largest living things in the world. Um, also, they live a very long time. I'll say more specifically in a minute about more about that. Um, they only live in California. The only place you can find sequoia trees and redwood trees um, are in California, except for one species, another species of redwood that lives in China. So there's three species in this sort of grouping Sequoia redwood and, and what's called dawn redwood are all closely related to each other and they only live in a small number of locations, although it used to be they lived in, a, we believe, they had a much wider range. Um, the redwoods in particular have been chopped down by humans and are now endangered because we've chopped down most of them. Um, so let's start with, uh, well, so let, here's a quick picture of the two trees and then we'll talk about sequoia and then redwood. So giant sequoia, it, it, you see on the left here is a picture of one. Uh, it's the largest tree on Earth. Um, its genome, we now know, is about 8.2 billion base pairs, so about uh, three times the size of the human genome. Um, and um, the, the redwood is, uh, and there's a picture of one on the right, is the tallest tree on, on Earth. Um, by the way, it might have been the largest, but we chopped down so many that the largest current tree is a sequoia. Um, and the redwood's genome is 27 billion base pairs. And the reason it's so much bigger, I just mentioned that these two genomes are very closely related. The reason it's so much bigger is that the, uh, the redwood is hexaploid. That is, it has six copies of every chromosome, whereas sequoia, you know, like humans and, and many animals, has just two copies, or it's diploid. So the, um, when, when David Neal first approached me about this project, he said, we, we've been working on some other large conifers, which all have very large genomes. And um, he said, what do you think about doing the redwood tree? And, and I said, I don't know anything about redwoods uh, or genomes, except that it's an iconic tree. And he said, well, it's, it's on the order of 30 billion base pairs and it's hexaploid. And I said, this is kind of crazy. I don't know if we could do that. And he said, well, if I can get funding, would you want, want to try? And I said, well, sure, we could try. Um, and sequencing technology is constantly getting better. So this was a few years ago. Um, and we were able to, uh, we decided to make the project focus on both these trees and start with sequoia because even though at 9 billion base pairs, it's three times the size of human and very challenging, it's still not as difficult as, as a triple uh, version of that, which is the, the redwood genome. So we started with sequoia. We sequenced that first, assembled that first. Um, and then turn to redwood. So I'm going to tell you about, but, and we've now got results on both of these, which I'm going to tell you about over the next uh, half hour. So just to give you a, a sort of graphic, I thought I'd throw this in here for people who haven't ever seen redwoods or sequoias. They look in the photos like large pine trees, at least that's what they look like to me when I first saw them in photos. But if you actually go and visit them, the sense of scale is, is really awe-inspiring. So this is just showing you the coast redwood and giant sequoia next to a 
a 10 story building and you see over on the left um, a sort of normal size tree an apple tree that probably many of you have seen so they really are order of magnitude bigger than the sort of regular trees so, so let's now turn to sequoia so the uh, giant sequoia um, we finished sequencing it um, about two and a half years ago in, in uh, late 2017 um, the assembly so assemblies of these large data sets and I'll give you some some numbers for how much data there is. They take many months. Um, and we usually go through several rounds. Um, so we finished our, our assembly um, about a year later, December 2018. It wasn't that we just launched the assembly and let it run for a year. We did a lot of things in between, which I won't go into. Um, and we, we also worked with Dovetail to do scaffolding of our assembly. And their scaffolding finished a few months after that in March of 2019. And you saw in the slide I just showed you that we made it, we, we announced that res, those results in April of 2019, about a year ago. So um, the tree that we sequenced um, is the, actually the tallest known sequoia in the world at 96.3 meters or about 316 feet. It's 1360 years old um, and 18.3 feet in diameter. So sequoias can live um, two or 3000 years. So this is a sort of middle aged sequoia. Um, and um, we're not revealing the location of it because we don't want um, tourists to go and, and possibly damage the environment around it. Um, and, and just a little story to get the uh, to, to get mature from this from this tree, you have to uh, we of course all of our to make the assembly work better. We want all of our DNA to come from one tree. So someone has to go out there, and this is in a pretty remote spot, and, and collect the material for us. Um, and and I'll say more about that in a second. So. So the way we did assembly, the way we decided to do assembly, which was a recipe we've used for other genomes, is to do a hybrid assembly where we use both short and long reads. So we use short reads from Illumina sequencers because they still remain the cheapest. Um, they used to be by far the cheapest technology. They're still the cheapest. Um, they're also um, the most accurate kinds of reads. So we get very short reads. These days, 150 to 300 base pairs would be typical, um, but we get a lot of them their error rate is less than four tenths of a percent. Um, and so we can, we can cheaply generate deep coverage of the whole genome, even a really big genome um, like Sequoia at nine billion base pairs is still affordable. Um, and we wanna get deep coverage, and by deep coverage I mean we wanna get at least about 60X coverage. It's nice if we can get more like 100X coverage in Illumina reads. And then um, in order to make a better assembly, we need longer reads to, to, to span all the repetitive sequences that are in all these large genomes. And for that, we use, um, we these days prefer Nanopore. We have used um, PAC bio sequencing, but for this project, we use Nanopore sequencing, which is all done here in, in Winston Timp's lab here at Hopkins. And there, um, the throughput is not as high, but it keeps increasing. It's now 10 billion base pairs and climbing, depending on which of they now have three different technologies. Um, the error rate is pretty high, it's around 10%. Um, that's you know, that's declining, but it's still quite a bit higher than Illumina. Um, and the read lengths are, are much, much, much longer than Illumina. 20,000 base pairs and up is not at all unusual these days. And so that allows us to span all the repetitive sequences that, that uh, plague assemblies if you only use short reads. And the coverage is now, we're able to now get some deep enough coverage that even without Illumina reads, we can do some error correction, but we rely on the Illumina reads to basically make things a lot more accurate. Um, so here's the data that we got for, for Sequoia. We, we generated from, uh, for the Illumina data, we, generate, we used a HiSeq, generated 7.8 billion, 150 base pair reads. That's about 135X coverage. Um, it all came from a single seed. And over here on the right, I have a picture of a seed. I don't think this was our seed. This is a picture of a redwood seed, but a Sequoia seed would look very similar. It's very small. Um, and you might think, you might want to know why do you want to, you have a gigantic tree, so you have all the DNA really you want, why use a single seed? Well, this is a trick that we, that we first used for the Lobbolly pine, which we published about six years ago, and then for several other conifers. So conifers all have this really nice feature that they're, the, the seeds, um, which we call pine nuts um, in Lobbolly pine, um, are haploid. So the seed is called, a, once you peel off the outer surface, it's called a megagametophyte. And all the DNA in that is, is, is haploid. That is, there's only one copy of each chromosome. And that makes assembly much, much easier. Because one of the things that does, that, that makes diploid assemblies more difficult is that the two different copies of the chromosomes 
diverge from one another and the assembler will tend to make two different assemblies when you really only want one copy for each chromosome um, or one assembly for each chromosome. So by using a um, mega gametophyte um, for the Illumina data, we can generate haploid DNA and then that will make assembly easier. So our assembly is, you know, our attempt is to make the whole genome uh, to have one, one sequence for each chromosome. Uh, we can't get enough DNA from a single seed to generate the nanopore data, but we are able to get enough DNA from a single, single seed to generate, as you see here, um, 7.8 billion reads. So, so that's what we did for both sequoia and redwood and for previous uh, uh, conifer genomes that we've sequenced. So the way that we, so let me just tell you about our assembly recipe. Um, so the way we put things together is using a, a system called Mazurka that's led by a colleague of mine, um, Alexi Zimmon, who's been working on this for years and it's, it's really evolved over the years. Um, it has um, built into it a number of methods. One is this hybrid assembly approach where you take short and long reads and you merge them together. And um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of technical detail here to give you the flavor of it. So first we take the Illumina reads, we build them in, we assemble them into what are called super reads, which you can think of as just slightly longer, maybe two or three times as long as the Illumina reads a sort of very conservative assembly that'll reduce the data set down to many fewer reads and they'll be longer, but also it, they'll be even more accurate than the Illumina reads. So these are very highly accurate, um, but still short reads will be a few hundred base pairs long. And then we take our long reads, which could be PacBio or, or Nanopore, and we're gonna turn each of those into a thing we call a mega read. Um, so that's shown sort of graphically here. We take these super reads and we map them onto the, to each of the Nanopore reads. Uh, and then merge them all together using the nanopore read as kind of a guide. And that gives us essentially, um, the nanopore read gets turned into a really long, highly accurate read because we really, what we do is we replace its sequence with the sequence of the super reads, which in turn came from the Illumina reads. So we might have a 10% error rate on these long blue things here, these nanopore reads. But by the time we're done, we have reads that are, that are almost as long um, and that have an error rate of, of much less than 1%. Um, usually less than one tenth of one percent. And that's what we then assemble with sort of a conventional overlap based assembler once we have these really long reads. Um, I just wanted to give you a little more detail about that. So here I'm showing the, in green the, the um, super reads and we also kind of merge them together a little bit first and we map them onto the, um, we map them onto the nanopore reads. Each nanopore read has this done to it and we find a path across the nanopore read, and then we just replace the nanopore sequence with this super read sequence. So now we've got a really long, um, highly accurate read. And um, sometimes there might be a gap, so the Illumina reads might not cover all the nanopore reads, so I intentionally left a gap here in the middle. So then the mega, these mega reads, these long green things, won't be quite as long as the nanopore reads, but we know for each nanopore read that these two mega reads here came from the same uh, nanopore reads, so we can link them together and we do that. We create an artificial uh, sort of mate pair that links those two together um, and we'll add that to the assembly process. So we'll be, create this, a little bit of sequence we'll take out of each one of those and, and create a synthetic sort of paired read, but we know that the, that will help us keep those together. And we throw all that into a big assembly. So I also wanted to mention um, just a, a hat tip to Winston Timps lab. They went to a lot of trouble to optimize our Oxford nanopore sequencing protocol here. Um, read length is everything um, in, in trying to make a good assembly. But we also, um, we did this whole project on a pretty limited budget. We wanted to figure out the optimal trade-off between read length and um, the, the yield per flow cell. And so this just shows you some data from various experiments where as the read length gets longer, you get less yield because basically you're sort of restricting the amount of DNA you're putting onto the flow cell and only using um, longer fragments. And so you have less of them. Um, so we chose a kind of a sweet spot where we thought we would get um, uh, the best sort of trade-off between read length, which we wanted to be more than 10,000 base pairs and yield per, per flow cell. So in the end, this was our nanopore data. Um, we did 13 runs um, uh, or flow cells. Um, this is, we would get more today, uh, more yield output today. This was a couple of years ago now. Um, we generated about 24 million reads. The uh, N50 length, which is a weighted average of the read length, was about 9,500 base pairs. That's a total of 182 billion bases or about 22x coverage. And now this data came from needle tissue. Here's a picture of what the needles look like on sequoias. Um, and 
the reason is we need a lot more DNA to do nanopore sequencing. So we couldn't use that same seed that was already all used up by the Illumina sequencing. And the, the needle tissue is diploid. Um, but an important feature of our recipe here is by the process that I just described, we're basically replacing the nanopore sequence with the super reads, which in turn came from Illumina reads. So these diploid sequences, uh, this diploid DNA is actually all going to be essentially replaced or nearly all replaced with, with um, the haploid DNA. So that's, that's going to make the assembly go uh, more smoothly. So we take all, so let me just give you a little, a little bit of sort of background. We've done this before. We used a similar recipe for loblolly pine. That was the first big pine genome that we did or conifer genome we did. That's about 22 billion base pairs long. Um, we published that back in 2014. Um, and then we went on to do the sugar pine, which is even bigger uh, at 31 billion base pairs. And then Douglas fir, um, which is 18 billion base pairs. So we did all, these are all projects I did uh, with David Neal at UC Davis. So we've got, um, we've been working on uh, conifer genomes for quite a few years now. This is sort of the background that led us to take on the sequoia and the redwood. We knew we, we knew we could do something and we thought we could do a pretty good job of it. And the budgets um, kept getting smaller. We spent the most money on the first genome. And that's because the technology, of course, kept getting more efficient. Um, so the assembly has gotten better through this um, sequencing technology and also assembly technology, software and algorithms improvements. So this is just a picture to show you how um, if we just use Illumina data, um, we still were getting improvements there. Um, this compares our Loblolly Pine assembly in the middle here to our Douglas fir assembly, which was done a couple years later, uh, three years later. So the genome sizes were similar. Pine is, uh, Loblolly Pine is bigger. Our weighted average context size, we call this N50s, think of it as a weighted average, was, uh, was only 8.2 kilobases for Loblolly Pine. Um, and for Douglas fir, uh, it was 44 kilobases. So it was about five, five and a half times bigger. And that is just through, and in both cases, we only used Illumina data. So merely through improvements in sequencing and, and uh, algorithmic technology, we got um, a, quite a large improvement in context size. And you can see the scaffold size also went up by, um, by a significant factor from 67 kilobases to 340 kilobases. Um, now, when you throw in um, nanopore data, though, you get a, a much bigger jump. So this is comparing that Douglas fir, which is the, the best of those uh, earlier assemblies, which had an N50 context size of 44 kilobases, uh, comparing. So our assembly of Sequoia was about 8.1 uh, billion base pairs in size, and the, the average context size was almost 360 kilobases. So although that's still small compared to the genome, it means it's in a lot of pieces. Um, it's still much larger than what we were getting with Douglas fir, which is, a, which is a slightly bigger, well, about twice as big a genome. And you notice the scaffold size here isn't much bigger, and, and that's because we, um, the, the, whole, the whole process that I described doesn't do a lot of scaffolding. It's mostly building context. The only scaffolding comes from those little artificial pairs that we create to link together the ends of, of uh, the mega reads. So the scaffolds tend to be a little bigger, but not a lot bigger. So it's not really a separate step. So here's our um, first um, Sequoia assembly that we, that we published. Um, so just to give you a sense of how, how much, again, uh, for this particular project, how much the, the long reads helped, um, we did assemble, we assembled it first with just the Illumina data, and then we added in the, the nanopore data. And although the size of the assembly didn't change much, uh, if you look in the middle here, the, the average context size, the N50 context size, was only 12 kilobases with the Illumina only data and went up to 360 kilobases when we, when we merged in the nanopore data. Also, the number of contacts was enormous, two and a half million, so lots of little pieces, and that went down to 50,000. That's still a lot of pieces though, so um, we didn't want to stop there. So then we um, handed that all off to Dovetail and let them do scaffolding, two rounds of scaffolding um, with their high-rise scaffolder. And I could go through this, but since Mark kind of uh, described the uh, the outlines of what their technology is getting. I won't really describe how that works, but essentially the um, scaffolding here, the high c technology lets you get very long range um, links between um, different pieces of sequence and you lose, use those in turn to link together all of the contigs into very large groups. So this worked um, really quite, uh, quite well, uh, I'll, and I'll tell you in the, in the next slide, next couple of slides. So here's sort of our overall recipe to summarize what I've just said. 
We use Illumina plus Nanopore sequencing. We assemble it with Mazurka. We then scaffold it um, with the high-res scaffolder, and we hope to get whole chromosomes out of it. And as I'll show you next, we sometimes do. So um, one reason we were excited about this technology before we even went into this is we'd already used it for a couple other genomes. One is the walnut genome. So here, a quick little diversion. The walnut genome is like a normal plant genome. It's only 550 million base pairs long. A lot of plants are in that, that range, 600 to a uh, million to a billion base pairs long. Um, this was another project uh, also done in collaboration with David Neal's group. Um, uh, a few years ago, we did walnut with entirely with the Lumina data. And then more recently, we redid the assembly using nanopore data and got um, this beautiful assembly that um, using dovetail scaffolding where we had 20 scaffolds and 16 chromosomes. Most of the 16 chromosomes are a single scaffold. And this is a figure from the paper that shows how the, uh, the um, scaffolds agree um, more or less perfectly with, with independent linkage analysis. So that validated that the assembly was correct. And this paper, um, coincidentally, uh, it, it was published a few months ago um, online, but it just appeared in sort of the final version um, today. Uh, so there's a link down at the bottom. So anyway, this recipe of uh, using a combination of short and long reads, then dovetail scaffolding has worked for us for other smaller genomes. So how did it work for uh, Sequoia? So one thing I should say, because we did that walnut sequencing a lot earlier, the, um, even though the paper just came out, the sequencing was done some years ago, the read lengths for nanopore were much longer for Sequoia, fortunately. So you can see here a distribution of the read lengths. The red distribution shows you walnut where the read lengths were on the order of two or 3,000 base pairs. And for sequoia here in green, the, the weighted average length was 9,500 base pairs, so a lot longer. That, of course, helps. Um, so we got um, this pretty spectacular assembly. Um, it came out in 11 enormous scaffolds, uh, which ranged from a, uh, a low of 171 megabases to a, a high of 1.8 gigabases, shown in this cartoon on the left. And then 8,204 small scaffolds, the largest of which was only 650 kilobases. So these are all less than a megabase. These other guys are, are enormous. Um, there was a slight problem. The very, very large guy there had an error in it. So we then, um, thanks to some work by Danielle Puyu, um, an engineer in my group, um, she identified the telomeric and centromeric sequences and then looked for them in all these large scaffolds and found that really big guy had two centromeres, and it had a telomeric region right in the middle. And we realized that this was two chromosomes fused together. So the telomeres, of course, should only be at the ends, and the centromeres should be in the middle. So we split this one in the middle uh, to create two scaffolds. And that gave us our final uh, assembly, which is the one that, we've, uh, that we announced a year ago, which had 11 enormous scaffolds, and then this one sort of enormous one of 171 megabases. And these, uh, we, we, I didn't say this before, but Sequoia is known to have 11 chromosomes. So each of these is essentially um, a, an entire chromosome or nearly an entire chromosome. Um, and over on the right, we've put how many telomeres there are. And so most of them actually have telomeric sequence on both ends. So we're able to span all the way from telomere to telomere. All of them have a centromere in the middle. And then this last little guy, this not literally little, but this 171 megabase piece, um, that has one telomere. So we know this one goes on the end of one of those three scaffolds that only has one telomere. We just don't know which one. And I should say that that largest scaffold there, um, that's the largest scaffold ever assembled for any genome up to that point, 985 megabases. And we're pretty proud about that, proud of that. And we know this record can't be broken unless you use, unless you go and sequence a very, very large genome, because most genomes don't have chromosomes that are that big, a billion base pairs, and so it's very hard to break this record. Um, we'll see, though, it might be that we've just broken it with redwood. Okay, so um, we also just finished annotation. It has about 38,000 protein coding genes, and the paper is um, under, uh, under revision right now. So let me turn to, um, for the next 10 minutes, Coast Redwood. Um, so we're so this, um, as I mentioned before, is the tallest tree species on Earth. The record holder is 115.7 meters. That's not our tree. Um, it's highly endangered due to habitat loss, due to humans. And um, individual trees can live 2,000 years or more. The genome is, um, was estimated to be um, on the order of 27 gigabases, about three times the size of sequoia because it's hexaploid. So basically three 
sequoia genomes together. Um, our tree is um, 107.2 meters. It's the southernmost and highest in elevation, um, 107 meter tree on Earth. It's estimated to be 1,390 years old. And its exact location, just as with our sequoia, is being kept secret because we're concerned about um, habitat uh, loss and, and damage to the tree if we were to reveal its ex exact location. Um, and I should say that the, in order to get those, I didn't say this before, in order to get that, that um, the DNA, we have to get fresh needles and we also want to get a pine nut or a, a seed rather, a redwood seed or a sequoia seed. So you have to climb the tree and, uh, and we have a collaborator named Steve Sillett who has, there's been a whole book written about him who um, goes out and finds these trees and climbs them in a very interesting way. They, the first branch of these trees can easily be 100 feet in the air. So he uses an arrow tied to a, to a thin rope, tied to a thicker rope and shoots the arrow um, up until he gets it over the lowest branch and then shimmies up the tree that way. Um, anyway, I recommend the, the um, book about his adventures. So um, we finished sequencing Coast Redwood back in October, 2018, so about a year and a half ago. Uh, we generate 3.2 trillion bases of Illumina data and 582 billion bases of Oxford nanopore data. This is really a, an astonishing amount of data. These numbers, if you haven't been doing genome sequencing for years as I have, they may just seem like numbers, but they, um, they dwarf really anything we were doing, you know, even five years ago. Um, and then, of course, we then have to come up with an algorithm that can suck all this data in and put it all together. Um, our first assembly was finished in March of 2019, a little over a year ago. Um, then we again worked with Dovetail and they finished their, um, their uh, Chicago and uh, high-rise libraries in September of last year. And we, we had a, a new assembly um, just a couple of months ago in February, which I've not talked about before until today. I did talk about this back in December, but we didn't have that assembly at this time. So, um, so here's the Illumina data. It was um, uh, 10, 0.8 billion pairs, 3.2 trillion bases, about 122x coverage, assuming the genome size is 26 and a half gigabases. We didn't know the exact size actually before the project. We thought it was over 30, but at, based on the actual data, we're pretty sure it's around 26 and a half now. Um, and if you notice, um, there's a little histogram over on the left uh, just showing you Kamer counting on the Illumina data, and you can see there's three different peaks. That's uh, usually you see one peak, but the reason there's three peaks is because there's um, uh, the hexaploid nature of this genome means that some of the regions are identical between two of the subgenomes or between all three of the subgenomes. So uh, oh, one quick quick uh, aside, um, along the way in the, uh, in the Illumina data, we found um, an anomaly. There was a, um, a whole bunch of contigs had a, a much higher GC content than the rest of them and also deeper coverage. And we realized that there was a, that they, after we pulled them out and searched them against everything known, we realized that there was a fungus that had been growing on our on our um, on our redwood seed, and we had sequenced it actually quite deeply. So we assembled that separately, um, and it's a novel fungal species. I won't say anything more about that. Um, so the nanopore data took a, quite a while to generate, um, um, thanks to to students in Winston Timps lab and 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 also Jennifer Liu in my lab. Um, we generated uh, seventy about seventy five million reads. That's about three times the number we generated for Sequoia, a total of 581 um, billion base pairs with an N50 length of 12, a little over 12,000 base pairs. Uh, for Sequoia, it was about 9,500, so these are longer. And we actually, even, even if you look at uh, the longer lakes, we got um, 142 billion base pairs and reads more than 20,000 base pairs, and a fair number of reads more than 50,000 base pairs, 21 billion base pairs and uh, reads that are longer than 50 kilobases. All this helps make the assembly better. Uh, nonetheless, it's a massive, massive assembly. It took a long time to run. Um, we had a special, we actually had to increase the size of a memory of our largest server. We bought a new server uh, with two terabytes of RAM, which was just enough, fortunately. Um, it took about 330,000 CPU hours to do the error correction phase, and then another 700,000 hours to do the rest of the assembly. So about a million CPU hours. Um, and on uh, wall clock time, took about five or six months but it did finally get to the end. Um, and we got this assembly, which you'll see is not nearly as impressive as what I was showing you for Sequoia. A half a million scaffolds. The total length is about what we expect, 26 and a half billion. The largest contig isn't too bad, 2.4 million base pairs. Um, the N50 contig size is 110 kilobases. Now that's bigger than other um, 
assemblies we've had, but not as big as Sequoia, where the N50 was 360 kilobases. And partly that's just because the same one's bigger, is hexaploid. Um, the three different subgenomes probably have a lot of regions of similarity, which makes it harder to assemble. Um, all this is available, by the way, on our FTP site here. I'll put this link up again at the end if anybody wants to take a look at the data. So um, we had this assembly pretty good, not as good as what we had for Sequoia, much bigger. And we, we then gave it over to Dovetail and let them uh, run for a long time. So we gave that to them, I think it was last summer um, or last fall. And they ran for several months and they weren't sure the assembly, their, their scaffolder was ever even gonna be able to finish. They gave us some intermediate results, but it kept running. Uh, and then to our sort of amazement in February, it completed and really looked a lot better. Now the number of scaffolds, ignore that for the moment. It's really a lot of scaffolds. Um, the longest scaffold here is 1.2 billion base pairs. That looks like a chromosome length scaffold, even longer than Sequoia. And the N50 scaffold size, this is what was really stunning, was 61 million base pairs. That means that half of the genome, half of this 26 billion is contained in scaffolds that are 61 megabases or longer. So um, again, it worked really, really well. Now, not unlike, so there should be 33 chromosomes here. Um, there are 11 chromosomes for Sequoia, so there should be 33 for Redwood. We don't have 33 chromosome size scaffolds. We're not quite, um, quite at that stage, but it is really quite, uh, quite an impressive assembly. We were very pleased with it. Um, here are just the 10 biggest scaffolds. Um, this is very fresh off the press. You know, we only, this only finished two months ago. Um, so the biggest two scaffolds are 1.2 gigs or 1.3 gigs and just over 1 billion base pairs and then a number of other scaffolds that are more than 500 megabases. Um, we have looked for centromeres and telomeres in these and they do have centromeres and telomeres, but there are still some issues with some of them. We're not sure that these are perfectly correct, so we might still break one of those. So those top two scaffolds might end up being, the one of those might be the largest, might break our record, which was 985 megabases for Sequoia for the largest scaffold ever assembled, but we're still doing QC on these before we're, we're quite ready to say that. Um, but so, so even though we don't have 33 scaffolds that represent 33 chromosomes, we do have 53 really large scaffolds that add up to half the genome. So 13.6 gigabases that we add up to the 53 biggest scaffolds. So um, again, the dovetail scaffolding worked really well. We're not quite at a uh, whole chromosome scale, but um, it's uh, really, we're very pleased with this, given that this genome is so big and one of the largest and most complex genomes ever, ever assembled. Um, so just a kind of, so that's where we are. We're in the middle of analyzing that right now. The paper is in the works. We're doing annotation. We don't even have a gene list yet, so um, that'll all be happening this summer. Um, there is one interesting kind of sequence analysis question that we think we might be able to get a handle on, and that is the, the redwood has um, 33 chromosomes, but they're really three subgenomes. So you ought to be able to break these into three sets of 11 chromosomes. And now that we have these really big scaffolds, maybe we can kind of divide them up into which of the subgenomes um, they belong to. Um, we do know a little bit about the, the, the closest relatives. I've shown here on this sort of very crude tree. Um, Sequoia is one of the close relatives. And um, the three redwood subgenomes we think happened through two rounds of duplication or perhaps polyploidization. And it should be that um, two of the subgenomes, which diverge more recently, should be more similar to one another. And that's something, in principle, you should be able to discover by just analyzing um, these very large scaffolds. We have not been able to figure this out ourselves yet. If anyone wants to, here's our FTP set again. I'll put it on the last slide. Um, we, would, we would love to hear what, what people think if you want to take on a challenge. If you can figure it out, then we'd be happy to add you to our, to our paper when we, when we finish it. So um, that's where we are today. So that's, um, uh, I'll just end here by acknowledging uh, the, all, uh, all of our collaborators, um, particularly David Neal and his team at UC Davis. There's David looking at a tree, um, looking very thoughtful over there on the left. And here at Hopkins, uh, my colleague Winston Temp and members of his lab, Rachel Workman and Nora Sadowski um, in my lab, Alexi Zeman, Daniela Puyu and Jen Liu all worked on this project. And I'm going to stop there. Uh, oh, yeah, I should say all the data is freely available at, on our FTP site, also at the UC Davis site that I'm provide a link to here. And I'll stop there and take questions. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen. Super exciting stuff. Um, and uh, we do have a few questions for you here.
So, uh, and by the way, for anyone uh, on the call, um, type in your questions in the Q&A um, little bubble or little tab at the bottom of your screen, and um, we'll start going through some of these. So there's a first question is, is there software to identify telomere centromere sequences, or did you do this manually? Well, that's a good question. We essentially did it manually. Um, there is software to look for repetitive sequences. And so Danielle Pu, you ran that. And telium, centromeric sequences tend to be around 150 to 200 base pairs. And so we found pretty quickly a very, very high copy number repeat that was around 180 base pairs long. And we realized in, you know, in certain locations in the genome that made it look like a centromere. So we realized that's the centromeric uh, sequence. And then we used that to locate the centromeres of both these genomes. Telomeric repeats are, are, as far as I know, either six bases or seven bases in, in plants and animals. And we know what those are, so we can actually look for those. Uh, and they occur in long tandem arrays, usually hundreds or even thousands of copies in a row. So we, we, don't, we don't have an automated way of doing that, but we know what those sequences are, so that's how we find them. Excellent. Um, second question, um, congratulations for the brilliant work on those giant genomes. Um, have you performed any study on estimated genome size and estimated chromosome numbers? How did you do? So those studies were not done by us. Um, they were done prior to us starting the project. The estimated genome size of Redwood was um, 33 to 36 billion base pairs. The estimate was, was quite a bit bigger, so we thought it would be um, bigger than it was. Um, and those are done, as far as I know, by essentially weigh the DNA. That's an old technique that goes back decades and works surprisingly well, but it's, it's very rough. Um, once we have the Illumina data, we have a mathematical or statistical way of estimating genome size from, by counting short Kmers, uh, short sequences of length K in the Illumina data. And that's pretty reliable too. We found that to be more reliable than the sort of wet lab methods. Okay. Um, have you annotated the repeat content of Sequoia? If so, did you find anything surprising? Um, so, um, uh, Jill Wesgren at UConn, University of Connecticut, is doing the annotation and she's annotating the repeat content as well. That's in the works. Um, uh, well, we've done a good bit for Rick Sequoia. One thing I didn't say at the beginning was the, the reason that the conifer genomes, this Loblolly Pine and Douglas fir and the Redwood and Sequoia, all these genomes are enormous genomes. And the reason they, they're so big is that they all have a very high number of transposable elements. So they're filled with repeats, typically on the order of 80% of the genome will be these transposable elements. Um, the expansion of transposable elements, as far as we can tell, occurred a very long time ago, like perhaps 80 million years ago or more, um, and therefore affects all the gymnosperms or conifer genomes. And because it happened a long time ago, the repeats are pretty divergent now. It's um, and therefore, it's not a problem for assembly. So um, the only thing I sort of can say intelligent about the repeat content is there's very large numbers of transposable elements, and there's not just one kind. And they seem to um, have, uh, have expanded and filled all of these conifer genomes. And for some reason that no one understands, there was no real evolutionary penalty for, for carrying these around. Okay. Um, there's lots of questions coming in. <laughs> uh, uh, Couple minutes, I guess. A few minutes. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, did you do one came in on the chat box. Okay. Um, what type of error rate is allowed when aligning the super reads to the nanopore reads? Um, oh, that's a good one. Um, let's see if I can remember. So, um, we what we do to align the super reads to the nanopore reads is we build a database of short kmers from all the super reads. That'll be like 15 mers or 20 mers, and and then we essentially anchor for each super root. We find it can of course match many nanopore reads. So um, um, we have to allow that the nanopore reads might have an error rate of 10 percent. So we have to allow at least that much sort of mismatch between the super reads and the nanopore reads, and, and we do. So it's not a perfect process, but um, I, I think that's the best answer I can give without getting into even more detail. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at um, Have you looked at all at haplotype phasing or splitting in the assemblies? Not at all, and that's because these are essentially haploid assemblies. We use this 
whole strategy I described where we, we take all of the Illumina data from a haploid source, the megagametophyte or the, the seed, and we take the nanopore reads and we convert them into the same, we make their sequence as much as we can match the Illumina sequence. So it all comes from one haplotype. So there's no issue of phasing because there's only one copy of each chromosome. Okay. Um, and which is a great, I mean, <clears throat> That's these it. Assemblies are, I mean, these nice. assemblies are hard enough anyway, so we don't yeah, want to make it harder by really, making them. Really nice biological feature of the of the plant that allows you to uh, to easily get a haploid. Right. Um, thank you for the nice presentation. Great job. How do you check for redundancy? I'm not sure what context that is in, but well, I'll answer one. I'll answer. Okay. That as best I, you know, the way I would interpret that is so when we finish our assembly. Um, there's uh, what we always do uh, before we release it is we take all of the contigs that we've or scaffolds and we align them against each other and we typically will find that quite a few of the uh, you know, often many of the of the contigs are contained entirely within other contigs so those we would consider redundant because certainly this happens especially with diploid assemblies but it might happen just because of sequencing errors that you build a contig it's really not a different sequence so we then apply some threshold, you know, 99% identical or something like that across, you know, 98% of its length. And we say, okay, well, that's redundant. We'll throw that one out. So if they're, and that's kind of a judgment call based on the properties of the assembler and also the properties of the, of the organism too. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, let's see. Um, are there plans to go back and do more scaffolding on loblolly pine since it is still quite fragmented? Yeah, we actually did one round of that a couple of years ago using some uh, nanopore data and made a better scaffolding. And that's already been released. Um, but it still could, I mean, based on the results we got for Sequoia, we probably could do much more. Um, we don't have any plans for that right now because we don't have any more funding for it. So, um, and that would be something that I would, you know, if David Neal were, he might be in the audience here, but if he were on the stage with me, I would ask him if he's, if he's going to try that. But um, Mm -hmm. Not not right now. That would take more funding. Okay. Uh, how similar were genes from each subgenome? Are they variable enough to do phylogenetic analysis? That's a great question. And and as I think I mentioned towards the very end, I was going kind of fast. We have not finished the the annotation of Redwood yet, so I don't know the answer yet. We'll hopefully in a next month or two we'll have an answer. That's the best I can do on for today, though. Yep. Um, let's see. Wow, there's a lot of questions coming in. Uh, let's see. Any, any plans to sequence meta sequoia? Um, you mean, I think that's the, the one that's in China. Um, no, we, this was, uh, we actually, I didn't want to talk about these sort of dollar amounts, but this was, it, although Saber Red was, was very generous. This was a big grant for them, but it was a very small grant compared to the scale of what we were trying to do. And we don't have any money left to do another, another tree. Um, let's see, do we know anything about the biological cost um, of maintaining these massive genomes? That's a great question. Yeah, so um, I briefly alluded to that when I was talking about repeats. Um, there, so for, for millions of years, um, conifers were the dominant sort of um, life form on earth by, by sheer mass, if you ignore bacteria. Um, so they seem to have thrived, especially at higher latitudes. They're, you know, they cover enormous, not, not redwood sequoia, but, um, but other, uh, other types of, of uh, conifers are, do really well. Um, and they all have really big genomes. So there doesn't seem to be any real evolutionary penalty. That's, that's about as much as I can say about it though. It's surprising. You'd think that you know, making such a having such a big genome and having to copy all that DNA with every generation would be would be costly, but it doesn't seem to be. Um, let's see. Um, do you know the percent divergence between the A, B, and C redwood genomes and heterozygosity for redwood? Do you think there might have been phase switches? Um, we don't know that. <clears throat> I'm sorry, we don't know that yet. I should, I should, I can add though that for both Redwood and Sequoia, um, David Neal has, has a parallel project where he's going out 
using the genomes that we've assembled, he's going out and sampling on the order of 100 or more trees from the population to try to get a better handle on how much diversity there is and how much uh, you know, heterozygosity there is in, in, in uh, other trees. But we don't have the answers yet. There'll be other papers, we hope, that will, this, that will answer that question. Here's a, here's a cool um, kind of a more technical question about the technology. Do you think we are getting close to using nanopore only or pack bio only assemblies as opposed to hybrid assemblies? So um, if you, we are getting much closer to that, not for these trees, we obviously didn't do that here. Um, if your budget isn't as much of an object and you have more money, um, there's a more accurate type of sequencing called hi-fi sequencing with PacBio that can still give you reads of uh, as much as 15 or 20,000 base pairs long. So if you can get really accurate reads of that length at sufficient depth, um, you could probably do sequencing with just one technology and not with two. Um, it, it is currently more costly, but as we've seen over the last 20 years, sequencing costs continually go down. So, um, so we might be there in the next few years. Okay, we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, so how about, uh, can we do a, two more questions, uh, Stephen? Okay, sure. Um, let's see here. How did you identify the novel fungal contaminants? in the assembled genome. So um, I got to give credit to Danielle Puyu for that. She's done this in other genomes too. Um, we didn't expect them, but what, what we do um, with every assembly kind of routinely is we'll just compute the GC content of all of the contigs or scaffolds. And you normally would, usually organisms have pretty consistent GC content across their genome. And there was a clear, I showed a quick picture on one of my slides, there was a clear outlier uh, a whole bunch of contigs that had a higher GC content, quite a lot higher. It was like more than 10% higher. Um, and we realized there was something funny about that. We've seen this happen in other genomes going back as, as long ago as, as uh, a, a, a nematode, a parasitic nematode we sequenced uh, 17 years ago. Um, and uh, so Daniela realized that might be a different um, organism. And she also saw those contigs had deeper coverage, meaning there was a different copy number of that organism in it. So she then blasted them against everything and found that they were, they were fungal. So it was just more of, more of sort of systematically scanning to see if there were anomalies in the GC content. And once we found that, we realized we had something else there. Excellent. So I had, I, I finish off with just one question that I had, um, which is, you know, um, you've got this, these great genomes now, which are essentially tools for doing biology, right? So what, in your opinion, what are what are some of the things that that we can now use to apply these genomes to? What what kind of conservation? What do you think the highest priorities in terms of conservation projects would be now that you've got these really high quality genomes? So um, I'll I'll answer that and I'll give you the answer that that David Neal has explained to me. This is not what I do, but the idea is to use the genome to now go out and survey. The populations of redwoods and sequoias um, for future forest forestry management, especially for redwoods, which are endangered. Um, managing those redwood groves sometimes requires you to, to uh, remove some trees, and if you're going to do that, you'd like to remove a tree which doesn't uh, which doesn't have some unique bit of diversity. So if you know, uh, say, if a grove of trees are if they're all clonal, then um, they don't represent much diversity. If they're all different, then they do, and you can use the genome to go and, and, um, and, and just take a little DNA from each tree and figure that out. So that's, uh, that's the okay. idea. Very interesting. So it's, it's all about preserving diversity. That's right. Um, excellent. Well, I think we'll stop there, um, but for anyone that didn't get their question answered, don't worry. We're going to, I'm going to work with Stephen offline and get um, collate all your questions and answers that haven't been addressed and uh, send that out to all the attendees. I'll do that in the next uh, day or two. And uh, I just want to thank you, Stephen, for a, a super exciting talk. And it's, you know, I, conservation is really close to my heart. And um, that's, that's why I, I love working at Dovetail because of the conservation projects mostly and um, with, with climate change going out of control and it's, it's sad to see these trees going, but um, I hope that these tools will help us preserve uh, such a, an incredible uh, organisms. 
Agreed. Uh, yeah. So, um, so with that, thank you, uh, Stephen, and um, hopefully we'll continue to um, to to uh, maybe we'll get you'll get some more funding at some point in the future to do uh, the uh, Meta Sequoia, but. Um, but uh, it's been great. And um, so thanks so much again. All right. Thanks to all Thank the attendees uh, for your time. And um, have a great day and stay safe and stay healthy.